Amen. Thank you. All right. So in verse 22 through 24, we're going to talk about labor and how it produces profit. So also, so I got a text. Uh, uh, Ross is not going to be with us this morning. He's not. He's under the weather. Um, and I got an email from or a message from Kyle saying that he was praying for me this morning. So that was nice of him. So uh, did anybody, did somebody hear about the hunting? Nothing. Nothing yet? So far, they haven't seen anything. They haven't? Okay. Have they seen anything? Um, they saw one, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, that sounds like hunting. Yeah. Um, all right. So in verse 22, he talks about, do they not go astray who devise evil? So we are in 14. Uh, yeah, you can read uh, 22 through the end of 14 if you'd like. Yeah. Do they not go astray to despise evil, but mercy and truth belong to those who devise good? In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. The crown of the wise is their riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. A true witness delivers. away from the snares of death. In a multitude of people is a king's honor, but in a lack of people is the downfall of the prince. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. A sound heart is life to the body, but envy is rottenness to the flesh. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he who honors him Thank you. So we are going to start back at 22. As a side note, I uh, uh, most of you know that Bob and Gloria are uh, off traveling. And the last I heard from them, they were heading to Texas. I think they landed several days ago back in Texas to visit family. And then they were going to get on a cruise and go south somewhere. And I hadn't heard anything back. So I texted him this morning and I just saw that the message was not delivered. So I'm assuming he is on a ship somewhere without cell service. So, uh, so if you could pray for their, their travels back, I think they're going to be back on the 24th, somewhere around there towards the end of the month, this month. So <laughs> I'm sure it's warmer there, wherever they are. So Solomon asked us the question, do they devise evil who go astray? So what do you guys think? Is that true? Do the ones who devise evil, are they, do they go astray? Yeah. In what way? The, the um, condition of their life, the condition mm -hmm. of their heart, the condition of their conscience, mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, because we know that not all the time uh, somebody who does evil or devises evil, who plots evil, um, they sometimes seem to get away with it, right? So we know they're not talking about that, but the very fact that they are devising evil is going astray, right? That is departing from the Lord. That's departing from the word of God. So, um, yeah, right? Uh, uh, there is a difference, again, between the earthly perspective and then the eternal perspective, and we got to keep that in mind. Uh, mercy and truth belong to the next, the next part of this verse. Mercy and truth belong to who? Yeah, those who do good, uh, they will receive both mercy and truth. Um, in 
Verse 23, he says that in all labor there is what? There is profit in all labor. Uh, but the flip side of that is uh, idle chatter leads to what? Poverty. Um, 24, it says the crown of the wise is their what? Yeah, the riches is their crown. Uh, but the foolishness of fools is what? Yeah, it's folly. The foolishness of fools is foolishness, right? So the discussion question is, how does labor always produce profit? And why is foolishness or laziness or idle chatter always the opposite of labor or profit? So why, why does labor always produce a profit? Does anybody know? Anybody have any ideas? Yeah. Move. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 There seems to be something inherent in that idea that that's the way God set it up, that our labor will produce something, and that's oddly that's even built into the curse. Right, that by the sweat of our brow, that we will we will reap what we uh, what we've sown. Right. Uh huh. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, often I, so even now, even after we've been married, uh, if we take a day off uh, and we do nothing but lay around and watch TV or basically do nothing at all, I'm in worse shape by the end of the day than if I would have stayed active all day, right? So uh, there's something inherent in it for us as people that, that we need to be uh, Moving forward and trying to uh, the ant produce. Comes to mind. What's that? The ant. The ant. Yeah, talks yeah. We've about talked about him. Yep, yeah, we've talked about him. Yeah. So why is the foolishness or the fool, the laziness or idle chatter? Why is that always the opposite of uh, labor and profit? How is that the antithesis, antithesis of that? It doesn't produce anything. It doesn't produce anything, right? It doesn't produce anything good. It it is uh, constantly tearing down, right? The laziness, we know what that produces. Uh, the idle chatter is uh, something that is very akin to gossip, and that it will destroy people, right? It destroys people. It destroys relationships. And so it's something that is the exact opposite of uh, uh, labor and profit. So, I chatter. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I talk a lot. No, you yeah, don't. Sure. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think a lot of times, I, I, I think that my chatter is accomplishing something. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I've got a, a going somewhere with it. Right. And, uh, and, and usually I'm gathering information. Mm hmm Yeah. Which yeah. some people are terrible about. Sometimes, though, I think there's different stories of things. You have a purpose for your speech. I think chatter is like, so I think of someone specifically, talk. yeah, it's yep. talk is cheap. Yeah. Okay, so we have, yeah. Well, I think of that because we have one of our sons is 19, and he did have a tendency like to <coughs> ramble. He just like talks incessantly about absolutely nothing. Like when you get all the way done, I'm like, what were you even, like, you weren't even conveying a message. You literally were just listening to yourself. Mm. Mm. To me, that's like idle chatter, where it's like they're just trying to fill a space, and it's just cheap, just like read versus somebody that, I mean, mm -hmm. there are people who ramble, you know, but there's a purpose in the rambling versus just trying to entertain yourself. Yeah. So I found, I found that to be really true in my prayer life, mm -hmm. because I'll, I'll um, so many times when we come to prayer, um, we want to tell God how to do everything that we want him to do. Yeah. And 
really, in a lot of ways, that's idle chatter. Yep. And, um, you know, I, I think, I know that in, in my life, um, there are times when, a lot of times, in prayer, I need to shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. And that's not easy to do. And we're not geared to that. Mm -hmm. We're geared to talk. Yep. And, you know, dead air is a bad thing. Yeah, especially when he's telling us something we don't want to hear. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, verse 25 through 29, we're going to talk about the fear of the Lord. And that is uh, a, a popular topic in Proverbs. Um, he talks about how a true witness will deliver what? What does a true witness deliver? Sinners' lives. Yeah, he saves lives, right? My, the New King James says that he delivers souls. And a deceitful witness does what? Yeah, he speaks lies. In verse 26, we come to another one of these, uh, these ideas about the fear of the Lord, right? The fear of the Lord is our what? Is our fortress, right? Uh, it says our strong uh, confidence. Uh, the NLT renders it, those who fear the Lord are secure. Beginning of wisdom, it says, Proverbs. Right, yep, yep. It's the beginning of knowledge, right? It's the beginning of wisdom. Uh, it talks about it being, uh, like in here, it's our strong confidence or our strong fortress. In another place, it talks about being a tree of life for us. Um, so, and there is something, I think we were talking about it at the prayer group, that there is, um, there is awe. Right in that, but there is also what we understand as fear, right? If we acknowledge and can come to an understanding of who we are before God, and recognize who He is, um, that's a that's a weighty and sobering realization, right? To recognize not only who He is and what He's capable of, um, but also the fact that the things that He's done for us, right? For each one of us, He has shown an overabundance of mercy and grace to us that none of us really deserve and none of us have really done anything. There's no real difference that we can understand between us and the person who's not saved, but yet somehow God has shown mercy to us, right? Each one of us here. I heard a preacher, a pretty well-known <clears throat> preacher the other day on television say that God never hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. And I thought, boy, it seems like I've read a lot of stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. They often, so people often want to put God in a different kind of box than what the Bible uh, paints as a description for him, right? So he is, uh, he has many more characteristics than what the world would like us to believe, right? They want us to believe that God is a God of love and only a God of love, right? But he's also a God of justice. He's also a God of vengeance, right? And uh, he is a, he's a jealous God, right? So, uh, we have to take it. We have to take it all. You know, all the facets of who God is. And again, we are told uh, that that the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Right in twenty seven, it tells us that um, having this fear, the Lord does what in verse twenty seven. Yeah, he turns one away from the snares of death. Right. And verse 28, uh, it states, having a multitude is whose honor? Basically, having a multitude of people around them is whose honor? The king's, right? It's the king's honor. Uh, but we are also told that the lack of people is what? Yeah, it's ruin. It's the downfall. Uh, the New King James says it's the downfall of the prince. <clears throat> and I wonder if he's talking about his own sons. Um, really, he should be talking about himself, right? And uh, the one who is slow to wrath has what? In verse 29. Yeah, wisdom, he has great understanding. Um, he who is impulsive or is quick-tempered does what? He exalts folly or shows great foolishness, right? So the question I have is, this yeah, go ahead. Says people with understanding control their anger. A hot temper shows great foolishness. 
Yeah. Right. Which he's addressed a lot of times mm -hmm. already. And that's a that's a, a fruit of the spirit, right? Self control. Mm -hmm. Right? So if we are not able to control ourselves, we are we are obviously out of control. Right. And we see that in the lives of people who are not saved, who do not have not to say that everybody who is saved is in control, but uh, we do see uh, there is a, this seems to be this prevalence that people who are without God, they seem to be kind of overtaken by their own lusts, by their own desires, by their own um, proclivities to the point that they don't really seem to have a lot of control over what they do or what they say. It just seems to be that they are being driven by their own um, by their own lostness, really. Um, so my I question, remember, yeah. I remember in the church that we were going to when we lived up north. Uh -huh. um, he he preached a sermon on the pastor that was in the house. He preached a sermon on anger, uh -huh. and he never had as big of a backlash as he did when he preached that. Why is that? A angry because he preached on anger. <laughs> <laughs> even, even though it talks about it all through the Bible, right. through the Bible, you know, and basically to avoid a hot-tempered man, mm -hmm. well, avoid hot-tempered women too. Yep. Because um, they're destructive and they're not listening. Yeah. To God. Yeah. Why were they upset? Because uh, I don't know. They just thought that if if I'm mad and, tickled, man. and I come to you uh -huh. and I'm complaining about this, that, and the other thing, and I'm really agitated about it, then you have to listen to me. Huh. Okay. Hmm. But yeah. But so many times it's easier. Anger's easier. It is. Than um. Well, and patience yep. and really discerning. And that's something I don't think the church teaches enough mm -hmm. in sermon. Um, mm -hmm. Is is you know just thinking, God, how do you want me to respond to this? Mm -hmm. What's the right thing to do? Yeah, because we've always it's yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah. I find now in my life when I think I have control of my anger, I lose control. Mm -hmm. And so if something is always there, you know, it's there. Yep. And really lay it out. Talk about something and just for a brief moment I started to say something or I did say something and then I go, Yeah. You know, so where'd that come from? And yeah. My inner self. Yep. And my inner God is saying, Hey, 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 hey. Yep. We never have a handle on it. Yeah. We never. And when we think we do, we do yeah. Uh, yeah, we're gonna we're we're about ready to trip up. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. What's that? Right. Are you in submission to Jesus? If I'm in constant conversation with them, right. that doesn't mean I don't take trouble with that as much. But if I'm lost, yeah. then it's a lot harder because I'm trying to do it on my power and trying to do it on my own. Yeah. And the practical side of it is it's hard. So uh, from my perspective, it's really hard dealing with people, right? Because I am not... I am not naturally inclined to have a conversation with somebody. If I see somebody I know out on the street or in a store, I will go out of my way to avoid them. Yeah, so I don't have to talk to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and literally, it is not them. It is me, right? I, I don't, I just, for whatever reason, I don't want to do it. So it it is not our natural inclination uh, to to get along, right, with people. Right. Uh, it is, like you were talking about, discernment is a big thing because we have to, we have to put other people before ourselves. Yield and to the spirit. What's that? Yield to the spirit. Yeah, right, yeah, that's what she was talking about. Yeah, every time, right? The first and, one is love, you know, and that one covers a lot of ground. Yep. But the instinct, like Dave was talking about, is there, and we don't even recognize it a lot of times. Yeah. It's always easier. Mm -hmm. It gets results, too. It does, right? Uh, sometimes terrible ones. <laughs> so. You think, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it says becoming a Christian is going to be easy. That is only on TV. <laughs> they only talk about it on TV. I don't think, I don't think, I don't see anywhere where uh -uh. Jesus said, hey, 
This is going to be a piece of cake. No, it, it says that through many trials and tribulations, we will enter the kingdom of God, right? So uh, if we are his disciples, then we will suffer just like he suffered, right? Um, not maybe specifically like he suffered. There are some who are called to suffer and die for Christ, um, but we will in some way, there will be a cost, right? Well, Even to also us. Just the thought of dying to yourself every day. Yep. You know, because that's our biggest enemy. Yep. It's not, it's not the world. Yep. And it's not people of particular character traits or whatever. Our biggest enemy is ourselves. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So why is the fear of the Lord so, so important to us then? Why is that important? Why is it important for us to fear the Lord? Mm-hmm. Pain. Pain is, in, in my estimation, the most mm-hmm. God can give. Yeah. It'll keep, keep you from destroying yourself. And so if you know that God can inflict some pain somewhere, <laughs> yeah. step over that boundary, it's kind of like, don't touch it like a tent. Yeah. And don't go there. And right. Stay away from it. Turn, turn your eyes away from the things that go easy to them and not so soft. Right. Yeah, because he 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 protects us, yeah. right? With that and, fear. And, and usually through pain, mm-hmm. and the fear of pain. If you didn't have any fear of pain. Yep. Uh, one of the, one of my friends who was an alcoholic, and he finally quit drinking when when uh, the doctor told him that any one of your problems is when you drink, you don't have pain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, and we as believers, right? Our pain is discipline, right? That is God disciplining us, and it's never comfortable. It's well, never it's also in broken relationships mm-hmm. and bad testimony and everything. It just goes on and on. It's you can't hide it. No. I mean, you know, and um, I think, too, a lot of it, that attitude of fear of the Lord is, I need to remember who's in charge here. Mm -hmm. It's not me. So um, if I have faith, I'm going to submit. If I don't have faith, then I am showing myself in the world Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, I, I don't really believe what I say I believe. Right. Yeah. We, uh... We've been, I've actually been talking about with several people this week. Um, so I, I, I resonate with uh, Jonah a lot, right? Because I'm very, very stubborn. And I have a tendency to run from God when he tells me what I'm supposed to do. I'm like, mm, no, no, that's not right. And I turn and run the other way. And even Jennifer has made the comment before, you need to stop doing this because we are now married. And so by proxy, she's getting it as well. So every time I fight God, uh, she gets some of it as well. And yeah, <laughs> so it is, uh, it is a struggle for us, right? It is a, uh, a struggle with the idea of uh, submitting to God, right? Because we can know God all day long. There's a lot of people that come to church and know about God, and they know what the Bible says, um, sometimes better than than biblical believers, right? Um, but they won't submit to God. And that's, that's one of the hardest things that we can do as an individual who has come face-to-face with God, is to recognize who he is and what our response should be to him. And uh, that fear is really submitting to him. And if we don't, if we don't do that, then he basically, he turns us loose, right? And we get what we actually desire, right? We get turned over to our lusts. We get turned over to our our futility. So in verse 30 through 35, Solomon talks about about doing the right. So in verse 30, he says, a sound heart is what to the body? Yeah, it is, it is life. A sound heart, and we're not talking about the organ, right? Uh, we're talking about that innermost part of our soul. Um, 
we can't really quantify it. We don't really understand it. We, we can't put a, we can't take a picture of it. Uh, but it is that the Bible talks about that inner core of us that everything derives from, right? Our feelings, our emotions, um, our predilections, uh, everything that we desire, everything that we want, everything that we need all comes from that, that one place. And a sound heart is life to the body, right? It's life to us. But are, do we have a sound heart if we are not saved? Do we have a sound heart if we are not saved? Yeah, right? We don't, right? Our heart is utterly corrupt and deceitful and, and poisoned, right? It's poisoned by sin. It's poisoned by that sin nature. But once we are saved, once we become a believer, once we are transformed, he gives us what? Yeah, he gives us a new one. He doesn't repair the old one. He gives us a new one, right? So somehow that inner core in us is transformed, and then we have that sound heart as the as we are walking with God, as he starts to work in our lives, as he starts to transform us. We are not perfect people, right? But, but we do have that sound heart. So the next, the next part of that verse, envy is what? Leaves the bones dry. Yeah, it's rottenness to the bones. And we see that in the world today, right? We see that, that everybody wants to be a movie star, Everybody clamors to get close to them, to touch them, to, to uh, speak with them, to be a part of that world. And, and that's all envy. That's all envy. Um, when we envy our neighbor's wife or our neighbor's car or whatever it is that we are lusting after, um, that stuff tends to rot us from the inside out. In the next verse, in 31, if the if one oppresses the poor, he does what? Yeah. Yeah, he reproaches his maker. Right? And the wicked are banished in their what? In 32. Yeah. The wicked are banished in their wickedness. And the righteous have a refuge in what? Yeah. Yeah, the righteous have... How is that possible? How is it possible that the righteous have refuge in death? What does that look like? You have salvation and everlasting life. And, right? And hope be friends of Jesus. As a, as a believer, right, we die in hope. <clears throat> Right? We have a hope that we die with, and that is a hope that, that we will not only join Jesus in death, but that we will join him in his life, right? that we will be part of the resurrection to come, and that if we are part of the resurrection, then his, his blood will cover us at judgment, and we will not be, even though we might be found guilty, uh, we will not be held accountable for what we have done, for who we are. Um, for the fallen nature that we have, right? So that is our refuge. That is our hope. And do the lost have that? Does somebody who die without Jesus, what do they have? Yeah, they have nothing, right? Says. Yeah, right? If they die and the evolutionists are correct, um, they just cease to exist and they have nothing, right? If we die and the evolutionists are correct, we die and for all eternity... Our hope has been with us, right? Our hope, even uh, even in our non-existence, our hope, we died in that hope. And that is something that they simply do not have, that the rest of the world does not have. Um, so in 33, wisdom is in the heart of who? Yeah, the one who has understanding. So our heart can be, there's different kinds of wisdom, remember? What, what are the two kinds of wisdom? Yep, wisdom from above and wisdom from below, right? And uh, we can have wisdom um, in our heart, but, but we can have knowledge, but we may not have wisdom, right? And wisdom from the earth is, I guess, fine. It's, it's 
but it's futile, right? It doesn't really serve any purpose other than the immediate. But so wisdom, what's up? It seems to me like wisdom from the earth uh -huh. seems to be fading and, uh -huh. and uh, what I want to say, not pure, uh -huh. not really true. It, it always seems to falter. Yep. There seems to be something wrong with it. Yep. Yep. But on the other side, right, the non-believer uh, looks at human wisdom and it makes sense to them somehow. But then they look at wisdom from above. They look at the, the message of the Bible and it is foolishness to them. They can't make heads or tails of it, which is kind of a it's an interesting mystery that God does that. To, he uses the things of the world to confound the wise, right? Um, the very things that they think um, are intelligent and smart are actually a condemnation to them, right? So folly. What's, it's folly, right? It's folly. Yep. So what happens, um, what happens to the heart of the fool? In verse 33, the second part of it, um, I'm not sure if I if I phrase it correctly. So, yeah, but what is in the heart of the fool is made known. So, what happens with what's in the heart of the fool? It'll eventually be shown, right? You can have somebody that seems to have everything, it's all put together in their life, and they're moving down the road, and everything seems to be fine, and from afar, it looks like they are, they've really got it together. But if it's not genuine, if it's not true, eventually it'll be made known. Right. Yeah, it's uh, so I've been reading a lot about integrity, and uh, lately, and uh, it seems as if integrity, blamelessness, this kind of idea, is not that we are perfect, right? That word blameless um, has a connotation now that it's you are perfect, you that there's, there's nothing wrong with you at all, right? That they can't find anything, and that's not uh, that is not what a Christian is, right? Because we all know that we are not perfect. Right? We are not blameless. But I think the idea behind that word in the Bible doesn't mean perfect like we understand it, but I think it means uh, genuine integrity. Right, And I think that's something that every Christian has to have. I think a genuine Christian will have that. And, of course, we are all on a different part of the path, right? So we can't necessarily judge one another based on where I might be at might not be where Merle's at. Right, Merle's been a believer for longer than I've been a believer. And he's been walking with the Lord longer, right? Uh, there are some people, Kyle was, has always been a believer, right? Um, I had 17 years as a non-believer. Oh, okay. There, there was a few years in there. Yeah. So it, yeah. Yeah, I was, yeah, I thought he was six. Yeah. So it did it, I had another 10 years, Right. Before, before God did anything with me, right? And so we are, not, we are not perfect by a long shot, and we can't compare one another to each other um, and say that I am, a, I am a, a, a blameless believer, but Merle is not, right? That's not how it works, but we examine ourselves before the Lord, and the one who has integrity is the one who is going to do the right thing, both in front of people and when he is alone, he's still, when he is alone and behind closed doors, or when he thinks that nobody else is looking, when there's a possibility that he could get away with it, he still does not 
do the wrong thing. He still does the right thing, right? And, and I think that is um, this idea between the foolish and the wise, is the person who is wise is the one who chooses the right thing, even when no one is looking. And they're also the ones that pay attention. Mm-hmm. You know, um, my granddaughter was interviewing me the other day for a school project. And um, she, she said, well, why are you a Christian? Mm. And I made the comment, because it makes sense. Mm-hmm. If you look around and you see the lives of people that, that are either in open rebellion to God or just deny his existence or say, yeah, I believe in God, and then go and, and live their life how they choose to, mm-hmm. um, it's not it's not a pretty picture. Mm-hmm. It never is. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think that to me, that's, I mean, I, that's not the only foundation that I have, but it's a significant one mm-hmm. because I don't want to end up like that. I don't want, I don't want my family to end up like that. Right. So, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. God makes sense. Mm-hmm. And it's, I've always found it fascinating. So I was saved at 17, right? God took me, twisted me around against my will. And because I didn't, I did not want to be a believer. And um, I was a very happy Buddhist. And, um, but he said, no, you're not going to do that anymore. You're going to do this instead. And so over the years, so I, I surrendered, I submitted and I said, that's, that is your will. That's what you want. You are God. I am not. And I had learned that lesson the hard way. And um, so I submitted. But I've seen over the years, I've talked to many people, and there are people who just, who just don't get it, mm-hmm. right? They don't, no matter what, no matter how many scriptures you read to them, no matter how many times they may read the Bible, um, they just don't get it. They just, for whatever reason, it's not there. And that always fascinates me. Um, it's, it's a little, it's, it's saddening because I can't reach them. But um, why is it that God would do what he did for me, but not for them, right? And, but that's, a, that's, that's God's prerogative. It's whatever God chooses to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, so that's hard to hear, right? That's really hard to hear, especially if it's our children, Right. If it's our if it's our family, if it's our father, our mother or grandparents, uh, but especially if it's our children. Right. Because um, parents take they spend so much time, so many years raising their children, trying to raise them right. And that to see them walk away is heartbreaking. Right. Well, also, we have to admit that the story is not over yet. Yeah. And I and I have to submit to that. Yeah. It's not, it's not over. Yeah. We we have to, right? That's the only thing we have. And but but to have your child walk away and have them uh be uh, not walking with the Lord for 20 years um is very hard to hold on to that hope, right? Um it is there, right? As long as we have breath in us, uh there is hope for us, right? God can still work with us. But um but it is difficult um because it is possible that they, they will never be saved, right? It's very possible that that was their fate from the very beginning. So um, in verse 35, the king's favor is um, toward what? Faithful servant. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of faithful servant. Yeah. And, but his wrath is against two. Yeah, the one who causes shame, right? All right, um, that was the bell. I'm told to stop at the bell. So uh, next week we will start in, ver- in chapter 15. So uh, if there are no other questions, um, uh, George, would you pray for us? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Lord, we want to thank you for this time of fellowship and for the wisdom that we received today. We pray that you help us to apply it to our lives.